On this week in Enterprise Tech, we talk about T-Mobile trying to make their mark in home broadband market with Sprint at their side and some 5G mixed in. Plus, Brian Chi and I talk with Carl Klasik about the RSA comp topics, trends, and digital risk. Twyatt on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 332, recorded March 8th, 2019. RSA Conference, View from the Trenches. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Sophos Cybersecurity. In an age of evolving cyber threats, you need evolved cybersecurity. Powered by artificial intelligence, Sophos can detect threats before they strike, killing ransomware, viruses, and other cyber threats dead in their tracks. Get a free security scan and or free trial today at Sophos.com. And by Atlassian. Atlassian software powers the full spectrum of collaboration between IT teams and the rest of your organization. Visit Atlassian.com slash IT to see what IT can be by giving their products a try for free. And by Thousand Eyes. Companies that run in the cloud rely on Thousand Eyes. It's the place they go first to see, understand, and improve the digital experience of their cloud-based applications and services. Do the cloud right and improve services for your customers and employees today. Visit thousandeyes.com slash twit. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Morest, your guide through this big world of the enterprise, but I definitely can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the brains of this outfit, starting with Miss, our very own Mr. Brian Chi, Director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu. Chibert, great to see you, my friend. Uh, it's nice to be here. I actually just got off doing a um, kind of a different type of trade show. It's all about building management because uh, I'm actually starting to advertise being a wireless internet service provider. Fantastic. fantastic. I just, I'm, we've been reading this book called Crucial Conversations. We're required to read it and it makes me feel like that sometimes. Like, like I'm, I'm on like a different type of training. So hopefully it's been helping you as well. <laughs> <laughs> and th things are things are moving along. Oh, I just got word from the publisher that apparently um, Kurt and I our our second book on cloud security is supposedly shipping end of this month. Fantastic! Congratulations. That's exciting. Yeah, it is. Well, folks, we we're going to have a good show, and I think we should we're going to get into a lot of that topics of the stuff that's probably in your book as well, because we're going to talk a little bit about RSA Security Conference as well as we have a really great guest today to talk about digital risk. And a lot of the stuff that goes along with that. But before we do, let's let's just go ahead and jump into the blips. It's going to be just Brian and I today, and we'll go ahead and uh, talk about what's going on during the week of uh, security and and enterprise tech. So it, it wouldn't be a week of quiet without calling out a security attack or data breach. Now this week, a large Michigan-based healthcare and financial processing provider has called out as having a previous data breach. Now it seems their breach and attack is hitting two birds with one stone, both healthcare and financial data. Now, the Wolverine Solutions Group, or WSG, says that they have discovered that its systems suffered a security breach on September 25th of 2018. Now, you may be wondering how the network was breached. Well, malware from an unknown origin affected several critical path machines and encrypted a large number of the firm's records, preventing them from accessing the content. Now, it, it took WSG and an outsourced security firm 40 days to recover from the ransom attack after their initial detection. Now, it's not clear how long the breach and cleanup happened that WSG started to notify their customers, but they spent a greater part of December, January, and February sending out notifications to affected individuals. Now, here's the good news. The security firm investigating the breach found that no data at any time was actually exfiltrated from the network during that ransomware attack. Now, this may be a good topic for our guest and panel layer, but it seems more and more organizations need to look to data-centric security, security service providers, and more over security and information event management systems to help mitigate their risks of running into such attacks in the future. Stay tuned for more on that in a bit. Well, before I get started on my blip, 
I want to say to Brian McHenry, get better. I just got an email from him saying he got the con flu at the RSA conference. Oh, man. Ooh. Yeah, get better, Brian. Yeah, he's apparently running a hundred plus fever. Yuck. So onward. So you know how a while back Apple started to say, if you're doing a third party repair or you're doing a third party battery, we're not going to honor your warranty or your repairs anymore. Blah, 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 blah. Wah, wah, wah. Well, guess they've heard the light or whatever you want to say. And customers have said, I don't like that. So anyway. The story goes on. iPhones with aftermarket batteries installed by third-party repair shops are now eligible for service at Genius Bars and Apple-authorized service providers, according to an internal Apple document obtained by Mac Rumors from three reliable sources. The change was first reported by a French blog called iGeneration. Now, this is pretty significant news for iPhone repairs, as the Genius Bars and authorized Apple service providers were previously instructed to deny service of any kind for a phone with a third-party battery, regardless of the circumstances. Now, if the repair is unrelated to the battery, the Genius Bar and authorized Apple Service Center, Center providers are now instructed to ignore the third-party battery and proceed with service as normal, according to Apple internal document. This could include repairs to display, logic board, microphones, and so forth, with normal fees applying. If the repair is related to the battery itself, the Genius Bars and Apple authorized service providers are now permitted to replace the third-party battery with an official Apple battery for the standard fee. Before starting the repair, the Genius Bar must drain the third-party battery to less than 60% of the charge. Oh, that's the magic number when the lithium-ion batteries um, become unstable. If the iPhone's battery tabs are broken or missing or they're excessive adhesive, the Genius Bar and authorized Apple service providers are permitted to replace the entire iPhone for only the cost of the battery replacement at their discretion. So anyway, the updated guidelines went into effect this last Thursday and should apply worldwide. Apple will still decline service for iPhones with third-party logic boards, enclosures, microphones, lightning connectors, headphone jacks, volume and sleep sleep-wake buttons, the true depth sensor arrays, and certain other components. But for people like me that live in an amazingly crowded Apple Apple environment, all our Apple stores in Honolulu are horribly, horribly busy. This means that Apple users no longer have to be penalized for not being willing to have to do a reservation weeks and weeks ahead of time in order to get their devices repaired and might actually start thinking, oh, maybe going to the Genius Bar is not such a bad idea anyway um, now that I'm not going to get penalized by my third-party repair. <laughs> we'll have to see if that's true or not. Well, most retail organizations are moving into the digital age with transactions rather than that analog cash exchange. Now, this is for convenience reasons and ensure that they have a better handle on their clientele. Well, starting in July, Philadelphia is enacting a new law that pushes in the opposite direction. They will, they will be the first major U.S. city to ban cashless stores and retail establishments. Now, we all know that the reason for moving off cash is for businesses to have a greater efficiency for their employees who don't have to make a change or count cash at closing time, and also to improve safety because workers don't have to carry large bank deposits. But the backers of this new law feel this is leaving out a good part of consumers who don't have credit cards. Now, here's here's the odd statement in that. we They also are considering people who don't have debit cards either. Now, that's weird because debit cards require no credit checks or and they only require a bank account. And I would assume that the number of individuals who don't have a bank account is actually quite small compared to those who don't have a credit card. Now, it almost outweighs the need for this law since it could put retailers and businesses at more of a risk. What do you think? Okay. This one is one of my Hebert has an axe to grind stories. So, folks, take this with a bit of salt. I am not real fond of Huawei and, you know, some of these other people because I don't like the way they do business. But having said that, here's the story. This is off Reuters. 
Huawei is in the spotlight over the security risks of its telecom equipment and gear urged and urged governments. The telecoms industry and regulators this last Tuesday are going to work together to create a common set of security standards. Well, yeah. The bottom line is Huawei is actually trying to propose a whole bunch of security standards. And this was actually a call by Huawei chairman Ken Hu. And they're saying, well, we should have security standards. And it should be, you know, this view of the world. And I'm saying, okay, yeah, that's a, I like that. You know, I think it's odd coming from a company that has had some really interesting attitudes about um, privacy. Um, but that's my opinion and my opinion only. Um, I would much, much rather see an organization that's a little more neutral, say like the IETF, come up with some security standards. I've seen what California is looking, trying to do on security standards, especially for home routers, as far as classifying the level of security or capability of a security device. About time. I was actually approached by several large vendors way back saying, hey, why doesn't InfoWorld magazine be, you know, kind of the neutral third party so we can do the testing? And this came at, after the end of a really big firewall shootout that I did. But I would like to see a neutral party. You know, I'm sorry if it wasn't me, but hey, that's all right. I'd love to see the IETF or some sort of organization like the IETF do a real honest to God classification on security levels. And yeah, Huawei, I'd love to have you guys participate as I would like have having every manufacturer that does security devices participate. But I'm not sure I like a single vendor trying to force their view of the world on the rest of us. Now, folks, you know DARPA. They are the ones that brought us what eventually turned into the Internet and many more other modern-day technology advances. Um, now their next bet is in AI. This past week, they came out with their $2 billion five-year plan to advance AI and take it to the next level. Now, if everyone can do it, DARPA can, because you might be wondering what they will be actually be focusing on during that time in regard to AI. Well, they're, they're actually attacking some of the major AI challenges that we face today. This includes faster learning, using less data to train AI. Also, enabling AI to actually use common sense. That's an interesting one. And even, uh, actually, they're even going to create new hardware chips that essentially reconfigure themselves to optimize problem solving for any challenges that may arise. Now, the reason for these focus areas, well, DARPA, DARPA feels that they, since many of the algorithms used in AI today were developed many years ago, they're limited in what they can do. Now, DARPA wants to use them as a jump off point to enhance their capabilities in order to take AI forward in solving some of the future challenges that will arise in the next decade or so. Now, common sense in AI will be a massive challenge here. Now, giving AI a broader understanding of the world Something that humans take for granted sometimes could eventually make personal assistance more helpful and easier to chat with, and it can help robots navigate unfamiliar environments. Now, in order for AI to advance itself, it needs massive amounts of data. Now, DARPA wants to solve this by requiring less data to be more effective, knocking off China and other entities that have advanced, had the advantage in AI to actually having access to that abundance of data. Now, if nothing else, this research and development might be what self-driving cars need to move forward in that final phase of adoption. Now, I'm actually rooting for their success, and I will be looking forward to seeing how they change the AI landscape over the next decade. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, we have two really great bites. But before we get to those, we have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Sophos Cybersecurity. Now, it's it's not a new a piece of information to say that organizations globally are really worried about cyber threats, whether it's breaches, data leaks, or privacy, organizations are really looking to go on the defense. Now, it almost seems like every day we have about new data breaches, information about new data breaches. Now, what can one do about that? Well, SOFO Cybersecurity has an evolved approach to uh, to cybersecurity. There are, they are actually using advanced artificial intelligence to de detect threats before they strike. Now, imagine killing ransomware viruses and other cyber threats dead in their tracks. Now, Sophos uses deep learning to interpret data and respond to threats 
with little to no latency. Now, there are a ton of vectors of attacks, and they're actually increasing in sophistication week after week. Well, this is where Sophos gets to work and makes sure you're covered. If you have any doubt, there was actually a recent independent security test done by SE Labs that actually ranked Sophos number one in the best protection ratings across the, the broad spectrum of large enterprises and small businesses. Now, Sophos has provided an advanced technology for millions of businesses worldwide with their premium capabilities brought to both Mac and PCs users alike. And there's also Sophos Home as well. This brings real-time protection from the ransomware attacks, malicious software, and hacking attempts and more. Now, you might think, well, if it does all those things, it might just be tough to install or get deployed. That's where Sophos really gets to work here. They actually prevail. The, the interface is super simple to use. Management's done online, and it allows you to secure your own laptop or manage other multiple security devices, multiple devices on your home network and around the world. Now, you can sign up for a single account and protect all the Macs and PCs in your home from a single console. Now, because it's cloud-based, you can use it to keep your relatives secure, even if they're actually a thousand miles away. And you can remotely manage their security and clean up threats and keep their systems safe as well. Now, as you know, Sophos' tagline is security made simple. And so that whole thing is incredible. They actually make it really easy to use. Just log in from your browser and start securing your systems today. Now, whether you're a home user or a large enterprise, Sophos has you covered. In fact, some of the largest businesses in the world, use Sophos to stay protected from the ransomware attacks that have devastated businesses last year. With uh, synchronized security, you can manage all your Sophos pro products from a single cloud-based console. Go ahead. You can go try right now. Get, go get a free trial today and or free security scan at Sophos.com. That is Sophos.com. And we thank Sophos for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, at that time of the show, we jump into some bites. And this week, we have some pretty good ones to talk about. Now, the broadband market is getting a topic um, where it's constantly, consistently talking about it due to the lack of competition. And that is really the fact that ISPs really have a grasp on their customers. We like to call it cableopoly. Now, while T-Mobile thinks they might be able to stir things up just a bit here, with the advent of 5G, T-Mobile thinks it's time to start flexing their network's muscles and opening up their service to home and small businesses broad for broadband as well. Now, T-Mobile will soon begin a pilot of home internet service using a 4G router operating over T-Mobile's LTE network. Now, customers will get a free router. And after the merger between Sprint and T-Mobile, it will be upgraded to include the 2.5 gigahertz spectrum as well as 5G compatible hardware as well. Now, there is an interesting thing here that T-Mobile is actually claiming that once they're merged with Sprint, they should be able to provide customers an average speed of excess of 100 megabit per second to 90% of the country by 2024. That's actually not too long from now. All right, guys. So I, I, I want to, Chibert, I want to talk to you about this because I know we have to slightly channel a little bit of mo today because we, we're going to miss a little bit of first snark on this particular thing. But uh, let's. I want to talk about 5G in general because it sounds like is that going to be enough for people to really t talk about using home broadband here on a 5G, even if it's not even 5G up front? It sounds like 4G for up front. Yeah, this is what T-Mobile's offering is basically almost the same as what AT&T was saying was their 5G and then backed off their so-called 5GE. Um, <clears throat> keep in mind, LTE, while it is a truly wonderful um, cellular technology, I, I love it dearly. Keep in mind, the standard really only has four channels available. And they're even without, you know, this company, companies like Cradle Point and Mofi and so forth actually already have some um, very specialized modems that can bond up to four channels together. In fact, if you've seen some of the um, uh, TV stations doing live feeds, they're no longer got this big honking cable to a truck with a dish that's cranked up. 40 feet in the air. They actually have a camera with what looks like a battery pack with a whole bunch of antennas sprouting from it. What that is, is one of these specialized modems that fit onto these professional cameras that will bond up to four LTE channels together. So let's get to the point. What T-Mobile and AT&T and all these other people are basically trying to do is they're trying to get more leverage because 
they want to combat the fiber and the cables that are going in from the cable companies. And by doing this, it's almost a preemptive strike. Now, what will happen that's going to be interesting is T-Mobile and at and and all these big carriers are all in a mad rush right now. They are all trying to upgrade their cell towers and the most importantly, the cables feeding those cell towers because a lot of them are, you know, you know, they, they, they're getting kind of old and they need more bandwidth. 5G, true 5G is going to need a lot more bandwidth. And I should also mention that the only 5G standard that is ratified is called fixed point 5G. So if you want 5G right now in America, right now you can't have it uh, yet unless you're doing something private like, you know, what Seclu has. So. Getting more to the point, the T-Mobile guys are using this as, oh, look, we're so advanced. We're trying to do something really, really cool, but they're not going to try and fall into the same trap that AT&T did and tried to say say it's 5G now. No, 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 they, they aren't going there. They're, they're actually being a little truthful about that. But what they are doing is they're trying to say, hey, look, FCC, look at what we're going to be able to do but you need to let us merge with Sprint because a lot of people, a lot of the government is saying that this is not a good thing. We're not sure we like this. And um, I think part of the problem is, in, in especially in a lot of states like Hawaii is one of them, because there's so many different carriers on so many different bands and those frequency auctions have kind of chopped up the frequencies. Um, Hawaii only has three of the four um LTE bands. And this is actually a lot more common across America than you'd think. So sorry, I'm, I'm kind of ranting on here. But yeah, this is actually a relatively thinly veiled uh, attempt to leverage the FCC by saying, looky, looky, we're going to be able to provide all this really great services to our customers in, Amer in America. But let us do the mergers, you know, quit, quit putting roadblocks in our way. <laughs> let's let's talk about the data just a little really quick because I I think T-Mobile right now according to some um, third party vendors out there that have this data is they're actually one of the fastest networks right now they with their 4G they have an average of 31 uh, or so megabits per second while Verizon's coming second at 29.6 and of course Sprint is coming in there last at their average speeds of 25.5 now the interesting thing is I think almost feel like they're, they're, they're pulling the wool over our eyes here because they're saying hey we need this merger in order to be able to support this new service to add additional competition in the market and make it a more uh, a more uh, easier society for people to get that competition to get take that advantage. Now, the interesting thing here, we talked you talked a little bit about AT and T's five G. Now, there is a controversy between the T Mobile version and the and the AT and T five G to five G E or the, what they call the five G evolution. Uh, but unfortunately, they're they're only talking about forty megabits per second. Now, AT and T is saying, hey, listen, we're not only going to add competition. But we're going to make sure that home internet users potentially even have 100 megabit per second and support it on our network only, only if Sprint and I and us are able to merge. Now, this is that's the interesting part here. Another thing is I just noticed and was just a call out as that Sprint is actually going to court to block AT&T's controversial 5G and see how they actually can block that because it's misleading. It's not actually really quote unquote 5G. So what do you think, Cheaper? I think are they basically saying, hey, listen, the only way we can really offer this ability for consumers is if we have Sprint. But it seems like their network can support it without Sprint. Uh, you know, it's a good question. You know, my um, my little hot mobile hotspots are, right now are all Verizon. Um, the uh, comment from the chat room was that AT&T's been spending a lot of time and effort on upgrading their backhaul so that now they can concentrate on their uh, towers and you know electronic racks. There's an awful lot of work to be done all the way around. Um, yeah, T-Mobile. T-Mobile actually has some really good frequency bands to play with. Um, I've had some pretty good service from a pure speed standpoint throughput 
Uh, I actually get better in Hawaii off my Verizon than I do off my T-Mobile. Um, can T-Mobile do this without the Sprint merger? Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, can they do it better with the Sprint merger? Yeah, probably. Because remember, when you start talking about LTE, having more frequency range means you have more channels, LTE channels to play with. Right, but and you, you, need, you need the devices to support that, though. I mean, up front, that's not going to yeah. be true, I don't think. <clears throat> well, and yeah, and there is no such thing as a 5G mobile device because the standard has not been ratified yet. Right. Um, what they're talking about, and I think that's, I think what the article's talking about, they're saying be, they want to help break the cableopoly by providing a advanced LTE solution now, but for fixed point wireless. Right. Because realistically, if if you have a mobile device, that's actually much much harder to provision, um, because you're travel. In theory, you're traveling between tower to tower to tower, but fixed point is more predictive. It's not going to be, you know, your house isn't going to go down the street at 50 miles an hour. So it's easier for the engineers to provide for that, the provisioning process. Um, so we're going to see fixed point 5G long time before we see mobile 5G. And... Uh, there's already some people providing fixed point 5G now. Um, like, for instance, I will say up front, I am a CQU, um reseller, you know, kind of in a weird way. So take that with a grain of salt, please. But fixed point 5G already exists, and now it's a matter of everything has to kind of catch up. So I, I sorry, I digress. Yes, they <laughs> can do this without Sprint. I'm pretty sure they can. But it'll be a heck of a lot easier if they had the Sprint channels. Right, right. Yeah, I think for me, I think personally, I say AT and T better get to work because I have I have two phones and T Mobile and AT and T, and side by side, T Mobile usually blows AT and T out of the water, especially when it's uh, you know busy and lots of people on the same tower. So we'll have to see what happens. We'll have to see if they can actually do this and if they make it. Uh, have make Sprint actually uh, make the network even better and make it available for home users. Well, folks, um, we're going to move on to the next one because I think the next one is really interesting. Uh, and I'm going to throw it over to Cheever to talk a little bit about voice assistance. <clears throat> okay. So first off, this was this is actually a story that kind of fits in very nicely with a prediction that Kurt made not last year but the year before. So maybe it's taking a little while. But so a lot of people have been. You know, we love the Amazon Echo. We love Siri. We love all kinds. You know, we like the whole thing. We, we like Scotty going, computer. <laughs> but it's always kind of been, you know, people have always thought, okay, well, this is cute. You know, it might be really nice for someone that's wheelchair, you know, that's handicapped or whatever. And, you know, it helps them for things like mobility. But. Voice assistants have have been having a tough time getting out of the toy, you know, the so-called toy um, veil or whatever you want to call it. Um, but now, what this article from CNET's talking about is that more and more the penetration of voice assistants is getting a lot deeper, and more and more people are using it. And when you start getting a market with that kind of penetration, all of a sudden people see dollar signs in their eyes and say, hey, I can do this or I can do that with it. So what the article has gone and pointed out is that <clears throat> now, according to this report by Adobe, 36% of Americas now own a smart speaker, which is up from 28% a year ago. And 75% of those with smart speakers say they use the devices at least once a day, showing the gadgets that aren't the gadgets aren't just sitting quietly on a shelf or unplugged in a junk drawer. <coughs> Excuse me. So let, let me get to the point. The point is when you start getting this kind of market penetration, you're going to start getting more and more people with the devices and vendors and Inventors and people are going to start saying, well, I can do this or I can do that. 
you know, the very fact of the life matter is, uh, I, I originally thought, gee, I can, I'm not that lazy. I can just walk a few steps and turn on lights in my living room or turn on lights in my bedroom. But <laughs> <laughs> I've got, I've now got a whole bunch of Philips Hue devices in my home. And darn if it isn't really convenient to be able to go in and say, hey, Amazon Echo, please turn on my living room lights to 50%. See, now, I, 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 already, I still have the clapper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Lou. I didn't realize you had the clap. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist that one. No, but we're going to start seeing more and more. And I'm... I'm actually starting to see them integrating into different things. So our buddy Tim Titus, he keeps we keep having him on the show to talk about troubleshooting and things like that. Almost a year and a half, maybe it's two years ago now, <clears throat> he actually integrated the Amazon Echo hooks into his product because he's got a natural language troubleshooting interface. And he was saying, no, no one's been asking for it. But this article and my personal opinion, I'm thinking, gee, maybe we're going to start seeing more of this. And I'm hoping we're going to start seeing more of it in um, business. And I actually really, really like using the voice assistants to do things. So, Mr. Lou, you know, we already know that you you have the um, clap <laughs> once and turn on things. But what other things do you think you might start seeing Right. In, well, in the office, you know, wouldn't it be great if I could walk into a conference room and say, you know, computer, pull down the screen and turn on the projector? Right. What do you think? I, in the snapper? No. No, I think the, uh, I think what, what I really do think is I think the reason for the major adoption here is the fact that there's a lot of competition. Now, yeah, Facebook, Google, uh, Amazon, even Microsoft still in there a little bit with Cortana devices. I think that. The key here is with the push of that, uh, consumers are starting to think, well, I guess maybe we should at least try this out. And then, of course, Amazon does their major push to the low end of the market, making their devices really cheap and accessible to people, available in Amazon Prime and so on, as well as upstream in the market where they offer it on really high-end IoT devices and in internal devices in your home. So I think you know, I know the refrigerators have it now, so on and so forth. So no matter how ridiculous people think it is, it's becoming part of the norm. And I think that that's where the key here is. That's why there's major adoption. Now, what other devices will have that in there. I'm not sure. I think that voice assistants are interesting because they uh, you know, they take advantage of multiple different facets of technology, right? They take advantage of natural language processing. They take advantage of um, AI and machine learning. They take advantage of integration to hardware. So really, if you think about it, any device in your home or even in your business can integrate with this. I mean, I've seen people integrate entire warehouses uh, with it um, to stop entire uh, um, uh, uh, lines of, of of their like packaging lines to actually stop using voice assistants and so on and so forth. Um, so I don't know. I don't. I don't know what will be more adopted or what not won't be. But I do know that it won't stop. Now, one of the things I want to throw back to you is I know that I noticed that there's a bunch of topics that kind of go along with voice assistants. Now, the first thing being the fact that how accurate they are, and a lot of times some of these were uh, kind of comical back in the day. Uh, for accuracy. Now, they're getting a lot more accurate because of that. So I think that that's part of it. The next part is privacy. Now, you know, a lot, lot less people uh, believe in the Facebook version of the assistant versus, say, let's say Google and or Amazon's version of it. Now, that's another thing. So I, I'm wondering if you think that that's a play in it. And of course, finally, the other thing is power and memory consumption. So a lot of these devices, if you think about how low end you need to be to offer a lot on a device versus the Google Assistant, actually, they have different hardware requirements and, and IoT requirements. So I'm wondering if you think that might actually be a cause of it as well. Yeah, I think that's a real big deal. Uh, actually, Specs from the chat room had a really interesting comment about how much verbal activity can business environments really tolerate. So obviously, if you're in a cubicle farm, uh, voice assistants are going to be pro a problem. So I see it as, you know, the hot spots and the places that voice assistants would be really, really useful are conference rooms. Um, personally, I think I love having the Amazon Echo interface. I have a Rove Vive. 
uh, in my car. That has been amazing. And because I'm never, I'm not touching my phone ever while I'm driving. Uh, I think that voice assistance has actually increased my sa the safety of my driving. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I've, I actually have both the Google voice assistant and Amazon voice assistant. And sadly, because of the amount of integration, um, my Google device is actually unplugged and sitting in a drawer now. <laughs> Same with me. Same with me. I think I have a couple of them in the house, and I think that uh, Amazon, just because of they they put themselves at the low end of the market. I mean, a Apple is one of those. We didn't really talk about Apple and Siri, but it, the fact is, they're really at the high end of the market here. I mean, they're 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 only specific to their devices. They don't offer it on other smaller IoT devices and so on yet. Um, we're going to hear more about that soon, but I'm 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 fairly certain that they won't go into the lower end of the market. So I think that's where Amazon's capturing it uh, quite a bit. And we'll see more adoption there. But we'll have to see. We'll have to see what happens uh, in the near future. Well, folks, that does it for the Bytes. Next up, we get to bring in a great guest to drop some knowledge on Twilight Ryan and talk a little about the RSA Conf. But before we do that, we have to thank another really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that is Atlassian. Now, whether you are an engineer or one who wants to manage a large team and their work items, you probably have used an Atlassian product or two. Now, I remember way back in 2002 when Atlassian launched a perfectly timed product that met the needs of that emerging agile market. Now, originally it was conceived as a bug tracking tool, but the Jira ticket quickly became the digital record of choice for tracking units of work in highly collaborative and agile environments. Now, fast forward 16 years, DevOps is on everyone's docket and Atlassian is still leading the pack in areas that helps teams rise to the occasion. Now, Atlassian really is a collaboration software company that empowers teams around the world. Now, like all organizations, you want to ship products faster, more efficiently, and with higher quality. Plus, you want to ensure your customer's feedback is adds to the business value prop. Now, sometimes businesses fall short because they have all these disjointed workflows. Well, this is where Atlassian's wheelhouse is. They give you and your organization the power to manage complex collaborations. Plus, their tools and services are not just for developers. Now, Atlassian offers an affordable, reliable suite of tools from te for teams of really all sizes, from DevOps to Agile, IT apps to Ops to ITSM, and whatever's next. Atlassian provides the technology backbone to help modern IT organizations and services and support that kind of change that propels businesses forward. Now, with Jira Software, Confluence, and Bitbucket, Atlassian forms the backbone of effective cross-team project planning, organization, and communication. Now, with Jira Ops, Ops Genie, and Status Page, they help teams to better detect incidents, alert response teams, and coordinate response efforts to resolve issues faster and actually keep customers and other stakeholders up to date. Now, your teams can choose tools that are right for your current framework and workflow while trusting as you grow because they can grow with you. And it all integrates seamlessly with Jira and Confluence, which keeps your team from bouncing around from platform to platform. Now, actually, I've used many Elastian products in the past, especially Bitbucket. I love their repository. They have a ton of features that a lot of the other repository systems don't have. So I love, I keep coming back to them uh, quite often. Uh, like all Atlassian products, the tools for your IT team are easy and free to try. Just head over to Atlassian.com slash IT to find out which Atlassian offering is right for your team. Now, try Atlassian today to see what IT can be. That's Atlassian.com slash IT. And we thank Atlassian for their support this week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's that time of the show. We get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Ride and talk a little bit about RSA Comp. But before we do, let's bring in Carl Klasig, Manager of Product Marketing and Security Expert from RSA. Welcome to the show, Carl. Thanks, Lou. I feel like you're calling in uh, from the from your from your uh, from the RSA comp there, right? From your from your hotel room. That is correct. I'm still here. I just wrapped up shortly. Fantastic. Now, before we we have lots of RSA comp goodness that we want to talk about, but before we do, we always start the show with our guests to talk a little bit about the because people love to hear origin stories uh, and people's journey through tech. Can you maybe kind of walk the audience through your journey through tech? Sure. Um, I'm actually over 20 years now. Uh, started out uh, many, many moons ago, it seems like, um, in database 
uh, development software. So back in the day, uh, you'd buy the database and you also had to have the development software to build it out. So, um, but moved in to, into security uh, probably about 15 years ago now. And it stayed in security information event management, focusing on cybersecurity around automation, orchestration, UEBA, uh, all the things we've seen really evolve with SIM uh, as part of what customers really need to accomplish over the years. So it, it's been a very exciting ride. I, I've enjoyed it for no end. I started out in sales and, and went into product marketing and product management. Fantastic, fantastic. Now, we do have a ton of things to talk about in the, from RSA perspective, but before we do, I want to get in a little bit of a topic that we've been kind of talking about on other uh, episodes of This Week Enterprise Tech, and that's digital transformation and digital risk. Now, we know that digital transformation are really kind of on the rise. We, we hear that each part of the industry has a different way of doing it uh, to kind of move in more in that digital paradigm. Now, depending on the industry uh, and the different facets of the industry, what are, what are the risk factors here? What are, what are people seeing and what are, what, how are people trying to mitigate those risks? Sure. So the, the biggest risks really uh, lie in them, the digital transformation itself. Let me explain my thought process there. Right okay. at, at its core, digital transformation is the adoption and deployment of those innovative technologies that are truly interrupters, so to speak. So think of cloud. That's a huge one, right? And think of the surface area of IoT and now cloud add to everything that uh, you know, all the folks out there are trying to go ahead and manage and secure. And that is very daunting. So that's been a driving, driving force for all of us uh, to, to do for our customers as well as our own networks, right? So at the end of the day, we focus a lot from RSA's perspective, adopting certain risk frameworks. And given our pedigree, uh, we can tie a long time back to the different authentication and NetWitness platform and other SIM and et cetera uh, offerings that we have right down to, to Archer with uh, incident response platform. So uh, we, we really bring that pedigree to the table for our customers on their journey uh, of this digital transformation. That's interesting. So I think we're, we're seeing a lot of organizations, they, uh, they, they say, hey, we need to move off this. It'll be better for us. We'll be able to move faster, provide better solutions quicker. Um, you know, to our customers. And so they kind of go in all or nothing. Uh, they kind of get their feet in there. They don't just kind of step in the water and, and see how what the temperature is. They kind of try to go all at once. Are you seeing that as a major risk factor here rather than kind of scoping down what they move slowly uh, rather than going all in? Lou, I, I think you uh, you hit that early right when we opened up with uh, with your show today, right? Is that it seems like, you know, every other day or every week, et cetera, there's uh, there's a new breach to talk about. And those are really symptoms of how people are jumping in and not realizing the risk they've just added and uh, come, you know, go looking at it accordingly. Do I, what do I invest in cybersecurity as also part of my digital risk management? And what we hear a lot is they'll, they'll make these huge investments in, in you know, I, I pick cloud and pardon me for picking on it, but at the end of the day, um, they'll spend, you know, 90% on cloud and maybe 10% and realizing, oh my word, I have this cyber risk that I've now opened up. I need to invest in that. And oftentimes uh, it's after the fact. And it's one of the things I love to see as, as we talk uh, more shortly uh, about RSA conferences, we saw a lot of people recognize that, wow, if I'm doing those innovations, I also need to up my investment in cybersecurity because I have that much more that I'm vulnerable for and that much more that I, I put at risk. Right, right. Now, we're actually, the interesting thing about here is we're actually seeing, because of that, we're seeing an emergence of new uh, uh, new roles, like, for instance, digital risk officers. Plus, we're actually seeing, uh, you know, a lot of new additional technology kind of emerging uh, because of all this. Can you maybe take us through a couple of what we're seeing in the industry? And, of course, this is, again, we'll segue into the RSA comp and how that applies. But some of this new technology that we're seeing that will help organizations uh, move uh, more securely, even if they want to move fast. Absolutely. And I think a lot of it is paying attention to some of the risk frameworks that are out there and they'll map, some of the solutions will map to that. Um, you know, when you say they're, they're new technologies, in some ways they are though, you're absolutely right. But what I'd like to mention is the fact that in some ways it's really an evolution of some of the solutions that are already there. For instance, the GRCs that have evolved to, to really encompass well an in, in incident response because they have to. Because when we think about risk and cybersecurity, our customers have to tie essentially their security processes 
and investments to the business and the practical at hand every day. Because at the end of the day, they're trying to keep their customers, themselves and their partners all connected and have that uninterrupted business flow. Uh, so it's not just around the blocking, so to speak. It's mm -hmm. about how do we let the right folks in and how do we secure that data that uh, they are collaborating and sharing. So a lot of it will see kind of a, almost a reinvestment in some solutions uh, and an expansion of those such as, uh, you know, risk and, and intelligence on the lines of, um, secure ID and authorization and different things that we see out there. And like I mentioned with uh, the, that evolution of GRC, I, I see a lot of that type of thing. And certainly uh, you'll see outshoots that almost appear as new products, but interestingly enough, you know, much of it has a base from what, uh, what had already been used. Right. Now, kind of going in a little what we're seeing at um, uh, RSA and some other things at the conferences and some other conferences as well, um, we're seeing this kind of move to, you kind of alluded to this a little bit, is it, uh, adaptive authentication is one of them. The other thing is the they want more advanced security information event management systems because they want to be able to have continuous detection when they're moving data. They want to know, hey, I want to know when things are changing, when you know when behavior's changing, that kind of thing. I want to be able to know when what users are doing at any point in time, what data is flowing where. Um, is this is some of the new stuff? Is there is this helping in most of this kind of risk? Is it lowering risk? Is it adding more cost? Like, what are we seeing businesses do in this aspect? So, Lou, that, that's that's well said. I mean, again, that's why I was kind of alluding to things being more of an evolution, right? You, you captured it well. When we think of security information event platforms, you know, our SIMs, essentially that's what they've done uh, is an evolution. They have not, in many times, they're not actually adding that much cost to the customer or increasing it. It's really additional use cases and capabilities uh, that they can apply to their risk their digital risk management and gives them that added edge. It actually enables them to continue down that journey they're doing. Um, the same when we look at it uh, in terms of what we like to term as, uh, you know, threat aware authentication. In other words, it takes into account for authenticating users and et cetera on the network, um, you know, that these are the threats that are out there and these are the potential folks we need to keep an eye out for. Uh, so you, you summed it up very well, Lou, with that, uh, that evolution of such projects. Right. Now, something I've always asked, I, you tend to ask a lot of security people that come on too, is no matter the new technology out there, you're, nothing can really protect your users from kind of social networking techniques like phishing and anything. Is there anything coming up that you've heard of that, hey, not only are we going to protect your data, we're going to analyze uh, trends and so on and so forth, but we're also going to protect you from phishing to attacks as well? I think there's a fair amount of that. And, and let me explain my thought there. We see a lot of automation going on in our different security technologies out there, including SIP. Uh, and what that enables is some of that unusual interaction that really is caught right away. And it can be tied to the threat intelligence that, uh, quite frankly, is so accessible in this day and age uh, to see things that, you know, literally are, be, are developing as we speak. And UEBA and those deep level analytics tied to machine learning so it learns at machine speed um, and that's when we touch on some of the you know, AI and different opportunities that are out there for customers. And that's one way to actually stay ahead of what you're describing as phishing and others that are, uh, can be that disastrous if you don't have that level of intelligence. Makes sense. Makes sense. Now, we've been seeing a lot of things come out of RSA. And one of the interesting ones is this new Networkness product. Can you maybe walk us through what it is, what it's trying to tackle, and how it's helping organizations? Absolutely. So um, the NetWitness platform... Uh, it's essentially a, an evolved SIM, and, and let me clarify that. Uh, we actually have visibility in, in our solution, in NetWitness, that goes not just from traditional logs, but also all the threat intelligence uh, at the packet level, so at your network, at the endpoint, so you can go ahead and tighten up authentication. We have those integrations with uh, for threat-aware authentication, and also uh, UEBA, and the ability to uh, tie into orchestration. And, and I think we mentioned orchestration very briefly, but um, these are all key areas that allow uh, essentially visibility just from bottom to top, right? So north to south, east and west, and allows our customers to truly be able to see things in as near real time as possible of what's going on and who's doing what, where, when, and who they should pay attention to, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, uh, what we what we do with NetWitness for our customers with RSA NetWitness, uh, 
uh, with the ability of the different um, tie-ins in the platform is give them that capability to detect quickly, to always know what's going on, to understand exactly who's impacted so they can take intelligent action and to go ahead and resolve it. And we give them the, the tools and the information to do so. Uh, so that's what we focus on. Fantastic. Well, when we come back, I want to I get into the RSA Conf and talk a little bit about some of the trends we're seeing there. But before we do, we have to another great actually thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that is Thousand Eyes. Now, Thousand Eyes, each, each, each of us watch those action flicks, those sci-fi movies where you see all the war rooms where there's a ton of screens on the wall and they're watching their network. Well, wouldn't it be cool if that was a reality? Well, imagine if you had a thousand eyes. Now you already know that the internet is the backbone of organizations and enterprises. It's a complex network of nodes and data. And when your business depends on it, you need to have deep insights into the health and performance of it all at all times. Now thousand eyes is going to make it this easier for you and your organization. Nowadays, there's, there's a ton of cloud apps Pass and SaaS services like Office 365, WebEx, Salesforce, and more. And you can you have to have a view or a lay of the land of the network and the internet at all times. Now, you need to know how it could or, or is affecting your customers and their user experience as well. It's in the company name. They give you more than a thousand eyes to service the data you need to provide best-in-class service and view of your network. You know, you might say, well, it's if it's if it's that much information that that capable, it must be hard to set up and deploy. Well, Thousand Eyes has found a way to make it easy to deploy and start in collecting data in no time. They have a concept of network agents. Now you deploy agents throughout your network and you're instantly able to visualize and monitor and diagnose problems. Now, whether you deploy on a virtual appliance Hyper-V appliance or others, they really make it easy to start getting valuable information about the networks and how it affects your business. Now, those agents are actually sensors that are deployed globally and give a pulse of data what's going on in your network. Now, imagine if you had some users over or some customers complaining about their access to a service and they're over in Japan. Well, your cloud agent in Japan can give you the data they need to diagnose the network and what's causing the problem. Now, global sets of customers are not a problem with Thousand Eyes. They give you that vantage point of your network no matter where you're at around the world. Now, they also have the concept of enterprise agents as well, which is the same inside their enterprise where they actually offer, whether it's at a branch office or a data center, they can give you hybrid end end view of your entire network. Ha having used the power of Thousand Eyes, it really makes you feel like you are in the driver's seat because it gives you that end to end view of your entire network. Now, they put themselves in the point of view of your customers and your end users as well with their endpoint agents. They can give you a view of what customers are actually seeing. Now, all that data is collected, aggregated, and processed, and they use network intelligence. They provide network intelligence by providing really great ways to visualize the data and view it and actually provide notifications. Notifications. Now, Thousand Eyes puts itself into the brains and eyes of network engineers and IT professionals. Now, you probably envision a network a certain way with these interconnected nodes. You can see it there. Now, you can actually troubleshoot network by looking at, you can't really do it by looking at just charts and bar graphs and line graphs. You need to actually visualize the network spatially. So that's where Thousand Eyes provides beautiful real world sets of visualizations that really comp encapsulates the complexity of your network. And they give you that data where you need to run proactively and reactively on your network as well. Now, not only that, they have a unique path visualization technology that extends away beyond boundaries, allowing you to see and understand and improve the experience for all your apps, services, and websites. Now, no more Wireshark to try or figure out your issues. Your networks are more than just MPLS backbone networks. You need more than package captures and net flows. Thousand Eyes helps solve the real world issues with unique, actionable data for you and your organizations. Dr. Mohit Ladd is the co-founder and CEO of Thousand Eyes. He has experience of over a decade of designing and implementing systems and solving hard network problems. He and all the extraordinary people at Thousand Eyes will help you and your organization do the same. Regain control of your network and ensure the best possible experience for your customers and employees. Get an immediate unmatched view of all your network and dependencies that impact your user's digital experience. Visit thousandeyes.com slash twit to see what you've been missing. You will get the exclusive ebook on the five cloud migration challenges you shouldn't ignore. If the cloud is important to you, either today or in the future, visit thousandeyes.com slash twit. That's thousandeyes.com slash twit. And we thank Thousand Eyes for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, folks, we're talking with Clara Klasik about 
RSA and security trends and so on and so forth. But we, we do actually want to get into the RSA conf. So, Carl, maybe I'll, I'll kind of hand it over to you uh, to kind of maybe just go through some of the trends that you're seeing. And then I want to bring uh, Brian Chi back in, too, because he has some questions as well. So, um, you know, <laughs> we'll harken back to uh, your discussion on uh, voice activation, right? Because uh, essentially that's, it's automation, right? Imagine if someone could sit there and say, deploy SIM, how sweet would that be? Take care of it, Siri. Um, not going to happen, but a lot of what the theme was that we saw at the end of the day was a lot of automation and a lot of that intelligence uh, and a lot of that machine learning. And that comes down to a, a level even of orchestration that we're seeing uh, in the industry. And that really was a, a loud voice throughout uh, and, and that ability to collaborate and work across the solutions. And again, that reflects a lot on orchestration, right? Utilize those different solutions that our customers have optimally. And often uh, with some machine learning and the machine actually taking some of the work. And that also hits another button that you know we heard strongly, not, just, not only this year, but certainly is prevalent again, but it's been ongoing, which is, look, there's, there's only so many folks out there uh, in security that are you know truly that savvy at that level and uh, our customers and the industry are looking for solutions that can help them with that uh, we do a fair amount of that ourselves and we saw that throughout the industry this week uh, you know that ability to go in and take some of those mundane tasks off the analysts in their security operations team is a huge advantage uh, as they go down this uh, this journey of digital risk management and, and what they face so one, some of the things I've, I've actually seen now before the conference, now there's not been a lot of information coming out of the conference because people are still attending, they're leaving now. and But we, we heard a lot of trends that we're talking about. And I'm curious to see if you saw a lot of this here, there. Now, for instance, we, we heard a lot about identity management uh, and access management, the hybrid, hybrid cloud and computing utilization. Now, data, we'll call it data-centric security. Uh, of course, the talk of IoT devices and how it's um, now getting integrated into organizations and they need to be able to secure those and make sure that they have full visibility of those things, as well as security service providers. So I think, are those close to a lot of things that we were seeing? Um, and um, were there other things? No, they definitely were, Louie. They captured a lot of what we just touched on, right? Because those are those... Those are those pieces of digital risk that are really, uh, you know, driving the need for the different cybersecurity innovations we're talking about and evolutions. Uh, the, you know, the the cloud ability and um, the hybrid cloud that we see so much in our customers um, that was very prevalent. I, I can tell you many a, a customer conversation as well as, uh, you know, walking around the different booths and chatting with other vendors. Um, that was very much a, a driving force. And another thing we saw was a, a lot of collaboration. Again, you can you can tile this back to orchestration and some of the different automation, but um, that ability to recognize that, look, there's a lot of surface area, there's a lot of content, there's a lot of data uh, in order to go ahead and secure that and manage that well and have the visibility. Um, we need to work well and play with others, right? It, it goes back, Lou, to a, you know the old days when, when someone would say, well, whose responsibility is security? Well, it's Security is everyone's responsibility, right? Right, exactly. I think that we, we've had several guests on here that say it's not just uh, you know IT's responsibility, it's everyone's, right? Because you obviously, you're only as exactly. good as your weakest link, and your weakest link is sometimes your users. So you, they have to be aware of what's going on sometimes. So... Um, <laughs> So I do want to I do want to bring in uh, Chibert because he has some uh, questions as well. He wants to comment on some stuff. Chibert, fantastic. Actually, I'm I'm just asking for a little bit of soapbox time from you. We, you know, there was a dark cloud over the conference when Adi Shamir couldn't get a visa for goodness sakes. Um, I've been following the R, the S, and the A for a long, long time, and um, personally, I think all three of them can walk on water. So the question becomes, the soapbox question is, <clears throat> do you think we've been a little bit too U.S.-centric in the way we're looking at security? Do, we, do you think we need to have a lot more internationalization of security standards and um, best practices? Brian, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I, I think you made a statement that, that captures it a lot. And, and let, me, let me expand on that a bit. We certainly spend a fair amount of time as vendors and an industry, and we focus on meeting the different compliance demands around the globe, et cetera, right? Um, right down to some of the security and risk frameworks, fantastic. But oftentimes it becomes a bit too checkmark, right? So what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Um, 
uh, you know, I know speaking from RSA's perspective, uh, we do go ahead and, and invest globally, and so do many of our fellow vendors. But are we there yet? And do we give it the weight that we probably should? Uh, I would echo your sentiment that we're not. Um, I think many of us recognize how important it is, and we're doing the right things to get there, but we are not there. I did a fast story, a news story, about Huawei's CEO getting up and saying, oh, we, we'd love to see this view of the world um, as far as security standards. Now, obviously, from a um, corporate standpoint, every large corporation is going to want to see their view of the world uh, as a standard being adopted. Um, and I've participated in a lot, several IETF working group conversations. And <clears throat> I guess my best description for the IETF is it's um, civilized warfare, perhaps. <laughs> um, if you were to imagine um, how we could build some better standards, do you think it'd be good to have it at the corporate level where we can, you know, money is going to force people to work together? Or do you think we're going to need, you know, independent organizations like the IETF? What do you think? Um, I truly think you're gonna need the independent organizations to drive a lot of the minutia that, quite frankly, at the corporate level might not get there, right? Let's be honest. Um, however, I, I really think you need both. As crazy as it sounds, you have to have those contributions. But in order to drive it down, it needs to be a commitment at the corporate level. So it has to start there. So you have to have that feeder going in and then driven down by the corporate. And I'll tell you, when I think about GDPR, it's one of the things that I think brought a lot of visibility into maybe that, into maybe just how disconnected we can be sometimes uh, around the globe. And I think that was a positive aspect as, you know, as that's been ongoing. Fabulous. Thank you. I, that was actually a lot more than I thought I'd get. <laughs> um, the reality is, we we I personally think this this is me on a soapbox. We as citizens of the world need to be doing things. And um, several years ago, um, I saw this amazing keynote at uh, Black Hat where we start Ron Gear started talking about how the true edge of the internet needs to be in the home. Um, I personally think we need to see a lot more of that type of attitude. I think we need corporate citizens of the world, you know, cooperating. And I'd really like to thank you for a truly enlightened set of answers and uh, <laughs> really looking forward to hearing more from you in the, in the future. I'd be happy to spend more time. Uh, uh, it's really been a pleasure. And again, um, you know, always, always interested in this. This is a passion of mine. I've stayed in the industry for a reason. I love it. And uh, I'd be happy to join you again. Fantastic. Well, folks, we're running a little low on time. Um, Carl, when, if you could tell us where people can find you, your work, a little bit about RSA and a lot about the RSA comp. Sure. Um, please go ahead and you know head right to rsa.com, a, a great spot to, to launch from. We have a lot of social media. We have a lot of information and news from the conference. Uh, you'll find a tremendous amount of uh, customer use cases, which I, I think is always uh, fascinating whether uh, it's me as a vendor or not, but the exciting part is to seeing what fellow uh, folks like yourselves are doing out there uh, to address this journey they're on in, in digital transformation. So please, please visit and glean whatever you want. And if you have questions, ask them. There's a place to do that. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, folks, you have done it again. You've sat through another hour of the best staying enterprise podcast in the universe, according to 9 out of 10 RSA booth outages. But I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially my co-host in crime for today, Mr. Brian Chi, our geek in paradise. Chibert, where can the folks uh, at home find you and all of your work? Well, I am on Twitter as ADVNETLAB, Advanced Net Lab. Or you can drop me a line. I'm Chibert at twit.tv, but I think it'd probably better send it to twiet at twit.tv because then it'll hit all the hosts. And I'd like to have just a small personal message that I hope Adi Shamir can make it to the RSA conference next year. Um, I actually got a copy of their paper on dual key encryption when I was in high school. And that's how long I've been following their work. And like I said, 
they are gods on earth and they can walk on water. <laughs> Thanks, Shiri. I appreciate that. Also, folks, I want we also have to thank you as well, because you are that person who drops in each and every week to watch and listen to our show. You, you have to get your enterprise goodies each and every week. So we want to make it easy for you to watch and listen and catch up on enterprise news. Go to our show page right now twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all of our amazing back episodes, plus all the show notes, information about the guests and the co-hosts. And of course, more importantly, next to those videos, you'll get those helpful download and subscribe links. You can support our show by getting our your audio version of your choice, video version, HD video version, and listen on any one of your devices. Now, it's the best way to stay on top of your enterprise and IT news. So go ahead and subscribe and share with your coworkers and your friends. Now, after you subscribe, also remember, we do the show live each and every week, 1.30 p.m. Pacific uh, at live.twit.tv on Fridays. Now, come see how that show is run, especially the behind the scenes. And if you want to join the show live, you might as well jump into our chat room live as well. We have some great characters in there who give us information and questions each and every week. So go ahead and jump in there, irc.twit. That TV. Also, don't forget, you can follow me at twitter.com slash LouMM. You can get to see what I do on my normal job at Microsoft at check out dev.office.com where we post all the latest and greatest ways to customize your office experience and to add even more productivity. Now, I also want to thank everyone who makes this show possible. Especially thank you to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support us each and every week. Uh, and we, we love doing this week in Enterprise Tech, and we thank you for their support. I also want to thank our great engineers at Twit, as well as Mr. Brian Chi. He's our loyal and tireless producer, and he does all the bookings and plannings for the show. And we really couldn't do this show without him. Now, of course, before we sign out, we have to thank our great TD for today, Victor. Of course, we, we have to keep the tradition. Now, what is what was the topic of today's show? Uh. I heard in there somewhere digital risk and digital transformation. Oh, so close. So close. I would say data centric security, but thank you for playing, Victor. Oh, <laughs> I did do my research, though, uh, from Kurt's question. DLP stands for data loss prevention. <laughs> <laughs> One week too late, sir. Uh, <laughs> Brian, uh, Thanks, for was there. Thanks for playing. <laughs> yeah. Maybe next time. And and until next time, I'm Luis Moresca, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Sweet.